Dr. Mohammed Kamal is a medical doctor. He is the CEO of Omni Pathology Laboratory. He's a practicing pathologist and educator specializing in gastrointestinal and liver pathology. Welcome, Dr. Dr. Kamal. Well, thank you, George, for having me. Excited to have you on. Tell us a little about your personal life, some more about your work, why you do what you do. So I am a, a medical doctor specialized in pathology. I um, was born in Washington, D.C. I grew up in Egypt. I went to medical school in Cairo University, and then I came to the United States to continue my medical career. Um, I did a residency in pathology at Harbor UCLA, uh, followed by a fellowship in gastrointestinal and liver pathology at UCLA. When I finished my uh, training, I uh, pursued uh, practicing pathology in a, um, in the community uh, rather than going to academic route. And I started my laboratory omnipathology in 2009. And um, I have a passion for uh, the practice and the specialty of pathology. And uh, we'll talk more about what drives me in this field. Yeah, I appreciate that very much. So you were born in D.C. And then yeah. tell us a little bit about how that transition happened. So um, my my dad worked at the Egyptian embassy um, in Washington, D.C. My parents lived in, in the United States from, uh, I'm going to give out my age, but it's okay. So in the mid-60s, they lived here. And then um, his service ended in uh, in dc and i had to go back so when i went back to uh, egypt i was two years old so i have no memories of my i have a lot of pictures from being in dc and pictures in the snow but no memories of 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 uh, living because i was two years old when i went back but um that kind of like being born in the united states and being a citizen by birth facilitated my um, coming back to pursue my medical career. Got it. I appreciate that. Why pathology? Uh, so, um, very interesting uh, route to pathology because um, when I went to medical school from day one, everything I studied about the heart was attractive. I liked the anatomy of the heart, the physiology of the heart, the pharmacology of the heart. Everything about the heart was fascinating to me. And I finished in Cairo and I said, I'm going to be a cardiologist. When it came to the United States, I, um, I had to study to take my boards and be eligible to apply for residencies. And um, during that time, I was working and I worked in a laboratory. And from that work in the lab, I was a lab technician. And then I did some research in medical devices and in diagnostics. And by the time I finished this work and was applying for residency, pathology, I was a much more attractive candidate for pathology than for cardiology. The second aspect of it is uh, cardiologists and during the residency and the training, they take calls and they sleep outside of the house. My wife and I were engaged in Egypt and we came, got married and came. So now we have a small family. I felt the lifestyle of a pathology residency and pathology work would allow me to sleep at home every night and I and I, I felt that pathology is a good fit. So I applied a little bit of flexibility in accepting pathology. I got in and then I fell in love with it. It's funny how that works because, yeah. you know, doing the work and getting really serious about it and obviously getting really good at it leads to passion. Yeah, because also some people, they have interest in things to the a level of obsession, which I completely respect. Um, I didn't really want to be that rigid about it and and also i have to confess when i got into pathology i wasn't really sure that i loved it in the first couple of years and there was a point where i said well, i need to when i sub specialize what am i going to do and i couldn't find i was really anxious about that but then as soon as i found gi pathology and uh, i did an elective at ucla and Everything clicked, and I said, "This is it. This is my specialty." So I, I love GI pathology. Excellent. So, fast forward, or tell us through kind of a little bit about your career path. Um, I, I'm I'm not sure the traditional career path for a pathologist. Do most open up their own company, their own their yeah. their, their their own laboratory? No, I. Uh, 
this is also another uh, interesting thing that I did. So I finished and I worked somewhere and uh, I had a 14 months ex work experience that I would like to forget, but it, it made me who I am today. And, um, and after doing that, I figured, okay, you know, this is not the right type of practice that I need to be in. So uh, luckily, um, you know, my my background in labs before pathology and other things allowed me to be attractive for uh, for a large organization. They were building a lab in L.A. and wanted to hire me as a medical director. So I started as the medical director. I hired all the pathologists and I and I actually I have a picture where I'm standing there and I have drywall. They, they had, didn't have even built the haven't built the lab yet. Uh, and I, and immediately I found that I am, yeah, you know, I like doing this. A lot of senior pathologists that I knew from uh, the past during my residency kind of helped me in, you know, what I need to do to become a medical director. So I was a medical director uh, two years after I finished my fellowship, which is kind of like a very fast track uh, for it. But without their help, without their advice, without their guidance, they, they mentored me. And it was a tremendous help for me. Um, I'm the kind of person that I consider myself a lifelong learner. So I always want to learn. I always want to improve. And I want to go where the information is. I have no ego when it comes to knowledge. Um, so um, I, I did that. So I did very well in that position. That lab was extremely successful. I was recognized by the organization. I became the go-to person for the GI pathology specialty. And then after five years of doing this, I, I just had a moment where I felt, you know, if you're doing this very well, you might as well do it for yourself. And, and, not that I wasn't allowed to do things in that organization. I think this organization was my launching pad, but because I had specific philosophy about practicing pathologists, uh, I, I, I have a term, I say the modern pathologist, which is a pathologist who's proactive, who's going out and, and, and being uh, communicative with, with, with the clinicians. Um, pathologists in hospitals, if you remember, like not everybody, you know, uh, the, the, typically they're in the basement next to the morgue. Uh, they have no windows. They don't want to talk to anybody. The, the images that you see in TV series are like all these fancy looking morgues, right? I mean, we don't have that. These are only on TV. Um, <laughs> but I said the pathologist needs to take a more active role. He needs to be, he or she needs to be more communicated with, with the clinicians and proactive about things. So, I, I said, okay, let's do it. So I did that in 2009 and I started Omnipathology. We're in the same location where we started. And, and I said, I'm going to build it specimen by specimen, but I want to apply the principles that I have acquired over the years. And I wanted this lab to be a physician-owned lab that is mainly focused on quality and being a patient advocate. Well, that sounds like it makes sense to me. So... Yeah proactive working with the clinicians what is that what does that mean so we have a saying um <clears throat> somebody told me this joke and he was a marketing person but he knew a lot about pathology and he said the difference between an introvert pathologist and an extrovert pathologist is that when you talk to an introvert pathologist he's looking at his shoes if you're talking to an extrovert pathologist he's looking at your shoes so there is this idea that pathologists don't want to talk to people or they got into pathology because they don't want to deal with patients, but they also don't want to deal with people, period, right? Uh, for me, I feel that we are an integral part of the healthcare operation. We, we make the diagnosis and based on that diagnosis, treatments are determined. Uh, we get um, samples that may not have sufficient information. It's our job to call and ask the questions. We, we have knowledge about other diagnostic possibilities that we must be able to communicate effectively. I can see a GI biopsy slide and I would have five or six different uh, potential diagnoses. We call that differential diagnosis. It is, it is my job to communicate what I think this diagnosis is, but also to communicate the other 
diagnoses that need to be ruled out. Um, and without being proactive and without picking up the phone and calling and saying, by the way, the sample that you gave me, was it from an, an, a, a mass or a low polyp or was it a flat lesion? What, you know, all of these details, if they're not given to you, that doesn't mean that we can't call and get that. So that proactive approach, that being, being proactive also means that eventually you will develop into a true consultant. We should really consider ourselves the, the doctor's doctors. We are the consultant that the doctor will call and say, by the way, that diagnosis you gave me, you know, it doesn't really fit with the clinical picture. When I hear that, I shouldn't take offense. I should say, okay, what's in the clinical picture that I didn't really hear? Tell me more. And then once I hear that, then I say, oh, you know, it could be this, it could be that. Or even better, I can say, you know what? I think I'm going to send that case for a second opinion. Should never be an ego about this. And I always, I, I, I sometimes I teach and I, and I, I really focus on young pathologists and pathologists in training and things like that. I actually tell people that sending a case for a second opinion is a win-win. Why? One, if you have a diagnosis and you send it for a second opinion and they confirm it, then you establish, you know, your knowledge and establish the confidence that your the clinician who sends you the biopsy will have in you. But if it's wrong, you show that you are one, a person who has confidence that you don't have the ego, you don't worry about that. The ultimate goal is the best patient care, the best diagnosis. And then, and then you also demonstrate good judgment when you're talking to the doctor who sends you the biopsy and say, by the way, I send that. I think this patient needs a second opinion. I send it and that's what they thought about the diagnosis. And you know, I didn't think about it, but it's good. So now, and then you learn from that second opinion and you apply the same you know, diagnostic criteria that was that were used in that diagnosis from the consultant, you apply it in your future cases. That makes a lot of sense. Why don't other people do that? My guess is- uh, No, I, can, I, I can't say that other people don't do that. I, I talk about it because I want people to understand more about what pathologists do, but I would never claim that other people don't do that. Uh, but I'm I'm more vocal about it because I think that the the you know I think pathology is a great specialty, and I think that if you talk to little children and you say what do you want to do when you grow up, a lot of them would say I want to be a pediatrician, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a surgeon. I think if you talk to a child and tells you I want to be a pathologist, it would be really weird, it would be strange. You have <laughs> you have to figure out what is what is wrong with that child or how do they know about it, and maybe. Maybe maybe the, the the dad or or the mom uh, are pathologists. But I remember my uh, my second grade my child's second grade teacher was telling me I'm so proud of Ali because he's the only child that can spell pathology. <laughs> so funny, I, I I love it. So so many different questions I have um, with technology. I imagine that there's an inflection point between it making your job better and just not. You know what? I can tell you this. Uh, I am never intimidated by technology. I I truly believe that any technological advancement that results in better diagnostic capabilities, I'm all for it, right? Um, so I, I, and I think that this is an essential part of the, the progress of human race. We have to always be willing to, to take the, the technology, uh, technological advancement, understand it and employ it to, to help us. So when you hear about uh, artificial intelligence and you think that you know it's going to be um, replacing uh, certain uh, activities and physicians and things like that or replacing um, specialties in particular right because they have these they have this list of things that they say these will be replaced by uh, by by technology right when when you think of that um, I, I would tell you that artificial intelligence is going to make the pathologist's diagnostic uh, accuracy higher. Uh, also, when you incorporate an artificial intelligence with diagnostic data, then you may be able to have a better picture for the treating physicians to, to use 
and to maybe have targeted treatment for a patient instead of giving a medication for everybody with that symptom, that syndrome or with that disease, you may be able to say, okay, no, no. What we're going to do is that this patient, based on the data that we fed the AI program, is going to result in a more specific treatment for that kind of patient because the data shows that these types of patients respond better, then yeah, go we'll for it. So I, 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 I am a kind of person that welcomes that. And I think uh, people who fight technology end up being left behind. Probably true. Probably true. Yeah. Are you, does, does, does Omni, do you work with insurance companies? How, 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 how does that work? Uh, like that's an interesting question, George. Can 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 you rephrase that a little bit? I I know that there are some medical fields practitioners that are moving away from from insurance. Is that viable? Is that something you've considered? I, I think that that the the honest answer is what is happening in uh, our industry uh, when it comes to reimbursement uh, reimbursements is is completely unacceptable. It, it is, it's almost getting to a point of destabilizing the industry because I, I I'm going to be very honest with you about this because I think it's, it's, it's something that the audience need, need to hear. Um, if you, we learned anything from COVID, right? What happened with COVID? COVID hit in America, we thought we have the most advanced healthcare system, right? And a little virus brought the system to its knees. Why? Because we started to see that we have shortages in things that we never thought we would have shortages of. We couldn't find swabs, let alone testing, right? Um, and then what happened? We were not a large organization, but we got letters from the California uh, uh, Department of Public Health and from FDA telling us there are shortages of testing and we need to... Uh, we need labs like yours because labs have different classifications. And if you're classified as a high complexity laboratory, you could develop your own tests. They call them lab developed tests, LDTs. As I said, we encourage you to develop your own COVID test because there is shortage of COVID PCR testing. Mm. So please develop your own test. And here's a guideline on what to do to apply for the FDA uh, emergency use authorization, EUA. So that was something sent to all organizations, not just the big ones, right? So what I'm saying with this point is that all medical technology organizations, big and small, need to be supported. They need to continue to survive. And there has to be effort to maintaining these organizations. What we see now, there is a shift where the the big organizations are benefiting from rules and reimbursement cuts and things like that. And there are exclusions that are happening for smaller organizations. And at the end of the day, it's not good for the healthcare system that you only have big groups, big hospitals, the big hospitals by the small ones, the big labs by the small labs and groups, you know, are being swallowed by larger groups and by hospital practice. I don't think this is good for our health care system. And I don't really think that this is the only economic way to reduce spending. There are ways to reduce spending and there are so many efficiencies that could be done, but to just blindly cut reimbursement by half and stuff like that, this is not, it's not thoughtful. It's not intuitive. It's not productive. And, and that's my personal opinion. But again, I'm not really saying that we're not getting paid enough. What I'm saying is that there needs to be other things implemented in our healthcare system to allow the especially solo, solo practitioners to survive. It makes sense. And if the mission is, is great treatment, you know, for the patient, my sense is that you would want to have, for lack of a better term, smaller organizations that are able to be connected with community and have relationships with the practitioners like you're working to do. Not that big is bad necessarily, but um, big has consequences, just like small has consequences. Sure. And, and also, I, I don't want to dwell too much on this, but let me give you an, an, an example. You're going to the doctor 
uh, which of these two scenarios you would feel better about? A scenario where when the doctor takes a biopsy from, who takes a GI biopsy from you um, and says to you, I'm going to send this to this specialized lab. They do GI only, and they're really good at what they do. Or, uh, George, your insurance dictates that I have to send that to this particular lab. And and that, and then you would ask, does this particular lab have a GI pathologist? Well, we don't know. Do they do they are known to be better? Are they have do they have better? No, no, we don't. They just want us to send all the cases from your insurance plans to this lab. Which would you feel better? You would feel better when the, your doctor has independence in the decision making, right? Yes. I tell people the choice of where to send the sample is a clinical decision. It cannot be dictated by 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 an insurance company. I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm hope that I don't create a lot of enemies from the insurance companies. <laughs> but what? but that's but I don't care. I mean, I'm saying my opinion. This is this is exactly we need doctors to be independent and we need them to make decisions of where to send their samples without really restrictions. And that would be as a patient what I would want 100 percent. I would want the doctor to be able to utilize or exercise their discretion and the best way to treat me and my needs. That's that's what I'm interested in instead of, oh, you know, move them in, move them out. George, we have three minutes together and that's it. And I'm going to get your, you know, biopsy and then I'm going to send it over to the, you know, super lab over here and we'll kind of see what happens. I'm disinterested in that. I want personalized care and I want the best people to best people possible to be working on my case. Right. right. So we can all agree on that. Let's just wave our magic yeah. wand and start doing that, doctor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it was that easy. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, Dr. Kamal, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people learn more about you? How can people engage with Omni Pathology Laboratories? So um, our website is omnipathology.com. Um, on that site, we have uh, different types of testing that we do. We are particularly now pursuing tests in uh, oropharyngeal cancer to test for HPV. So we have a page for that particular test for patients and a page for healthcare providers. I'm also on YouTube. Uh, if you just go uh, look up Omnipathology, there are videos for me giving lectures on um, oropharyngeal HPV and on other tests that we do. And we have a lot of education material on our website. There's a page for education. We have case studies and things like that. And of course, some on Facebook and um, and um, Instagram. Excellent. Well, if you enjoyed this much as I did, show Dr. Kamal your appreciation and share today's show with a friend who also appreciates good ideas. Go to omnipathology.com. Check out all the resources and the educational materials that doctor has been talking about. You can find them on YouTube under Omni Pathology, and I'll list that as well as Facebook and all the other places on social media and the internet. We'll list all those in the notes. Thanks again, Dr. Kamal. George, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Till next time, remember, do your part by doing your best. <laughs>